What's up? This is Kay Flay, and you are watching Rock Sound. Hey guys, James Wilson Taylor here for Rock Sound. We're backstage in heaven in London today, where Kay Flay is playing a show tonight. She joins me now. How are you? I'm doing great. Um, I do love that this venue is called Heaven. I know, right? Yeah. I feel like an angel. <laughs> and we're upstairs now, so we're rising up slowly. <laughs> exactly. We're ascending towards God. Yeah, it's making it's making all of, sense. All of the of things that I've done name. right are really paying off. Yeah, that's good. That bodes well for the show tonight. I think that's going to be good. Uh, let's start off with the album, shall we? Talk to me about the concept behind that, because I want to get into the whole trilogy and all those kind of things you've been putting out within it. But talk to me about the initial concept of the record as a whole. Yeah. So the you know the record it's called Solutions and that that title came about really early and it appealed to me I think on a number of levels first of all I was sort of at a point in my personal life where I was just like I've talked about problems I've been dealing with my problems like I want to look towards solutions and find answers and find ways to kind of cope with myself and this life and this world in many of my songs I, I think about and talk about alcohol use and like that was my dad struggled with that and died from that and like so it's always been kind of like a theme running throughout um yeah my my work and my creativity and then like i love math too and you know there's a sort of an equation component to it so like the title really resonated but i think overall the kind of ethos of this record was how do i take a point of pain or angst or discomfort or questioning reckoning whatever and kind of just like pivot myself in the direction of positivity because that feel that felt and still feels like riskier and scarier to me than being like in my leather jacket smoking a cigarette that's a time and a place for both Say, but yeah, exactly it's exactly brave. it's brave and it, it just felt like for me personally creatively like I had kind of been in that other space for, for a while and it didn't feel as exciting or risky and this felt exciting and risky. Yeah let's talk about the single Not in California because like you say it's dealing with important topics throughout the album this one of course climate change and such a, a prevalent issue and again with the title of Solutions it's quite nice that it's, it's almost asking questions of people and saying like we need to find a solution here it's that other angle to it talk to me about how that one in particular came together totally so that song was actually written uh in a studio that's kind of sandwiched between the pacific ocean and the redwood forest just north of san francisco in california so it's this like it is like quintessential california beauty um and we were up there for a week like living in the woods kind of thing and you know, I think I'd been thinking about this this idea, right, that we're all in this collective double take. I feel like a lot of people in my generation and younger in the States and then people I meet all over the world touring are kind of looking around at the world that they've inherited and partially created and going like, wait, what? Where am I? You know, like the idea, and I know, not to harp on like Donald Trump, but I do think it's it's worth mentioning that like, He's been the president of the United States for years now, which is disturbing. And like, this is, this guy's a joke. You know, and it's sort of like, you have to go, wait, like, I am not where I thought I was. And I think that sensation of being disoriented and disillusioned is so pervasive. Those feelings just coalesced, I think, when we were in this wonderful place. For me, I think California, and I mean, you're, you can speak to this as someone who's not from America, but I feel like California represents sort of like the paragon of, of American identity and freedom and like li liberalism and like Hollywood and all these things that like America kind of stands for in certain ways. And it, and it feels like California, it's like, it is on fire. I live in California. And it's scary to see this place that feels like quintessentially part of my identity uh, become destroyed. So anyway, <laughs> I hope that wasn't too dark, but that was... No, 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 it's no, but that's the thing. Yeah. It's, it's such a vital conversation to have. And what I found really interesting about this album, and I guess a couple other people, uh, uh, some that you've worked with, which we'll talk about, but it's just interesting to me that over the last few years, while people have always been willing to sit in situations like this and talk about their views, I feel like it's coming back now. People are going, no, actually, let's put that in the music. Let's actually make the statement in the videos, in all that kind of stuff. I mean, yeah, I guess, how did you find the confidence to really hit the ground running with, with this issues-led record? Well, I think, I think the confidence comes from just a strong sense of self, you know, and having a team around you that supports that. Because, like, you know, any time I've been lost creatively or not stayed true to my my vision 
it's when there's somebody in the room or somebody, excuse me, who's a part of it that's like, whis- you know, like whispering like doubts or, and I think like the important thing, especially for people who get to be musicians for a living, like I can say whatever, I can swear I assume on this, like oh, yeah. I can say whatever the fuck I want. I Like most people have a job where they can't. And I think that like freedom of expression is kind of like a moral imperative or an ethical imperative on some level for certain artists I feel that way and yeah it feels like the stakes are getting higher and higher so now is the time you know when people legitimately like respect a 12 year old more than many adults in government you know that that's like okay that's like a wake-up call for for everyone that's a turning point right there if ever I've heard one um let's talk as well about some of some of your collaborators really because again I think it ties in with a uh, with this idea of people actually doing more action taking within their music uh, let's talk about Dan first of all Dan Reynolds because uh, I mean you've obviously been connected to him with him a long time and worked with him over the years what's he like as a collaborator actually in the studio environment oh so Dan so for this record Dan um, was a co-writer on this baby don't cry which was super fun because we got in the studio and he was like the record was kind of done and he was like I feel like the one thing that's missing is like a riff song and he, he was right like there wasn't really that kind of I mean I guess ice cream sort of has a riff but and so we're, he, he kind of came in with this idea on bass and then we started that in the room and then I took it to my producer partner and then we kind of fleshed it out further so it kind of had all these different like iterations which was really cool I was actually just with Dan at his house writing songs uh, for some other stuff um, Dan's great he works really fast he has a ton of ideas um, which is how I like to work so and it's just like when you make music with people you know well and you know their families and you know like you understand the rhythm of their personality for me that's very comforting and inspirational I know some people like to be out of their comfort zone I think creatively I like to be kind of inside it in terms of my collaborators sure no, that makes so, sense and in terms yeah. of collaborations outside of your own work of course uh, popped up on Mike Shinoda's album and yeah. he's, he's a guy who you know we've spoken to him a lot over, over this kind of campaign and whether he's talking about yourself or working with grandson who he's worked with a lot as well mm-hmm. he seems like the kind of guy who not only picks out people he really wants to work with because he admires them musically but likes to almost mentor them a bit was, I mean was that true of your experience there? Yeah I think Mike you know I met Mike at a really interesting time so the song that is on his record was actually written for a Linkin Park like writing situation and it wasn't a part of that record Um, and then obviously Chester passed and like Mike was in this kind of zone of like where am I at what am I doing what kind of music am I gonna make and you know I was really honored that he wanted to finish the song we got to work on it together and I think yeah just having known Mike throughout that process it's been it's been really cool the thing that he's taught me more than anything or reminded me of is like music is very healing (laughs) and like it's you know it's kind of it's a cliche but it's it's true you know like and we we talk about this all the time like and even yesterday I was having like just a really really hard day and last night was like maybe one of my three favorite shows in my whole career you know and it's like you get on stage or you get in the studio and you have an outlet and a channel for something that's so human and basic to us all and I think Mike really like drove that home for me and his passion his passion just for making music is incredible you know he's a passionate guy yeah well and especially when people like have had success this is what's interesting to me when people have had massive like international like you can retire kind of success and they remain like humble driven and committed to the original project that's kind of that's a that's a goal situation. <laughs> Mike Shinoda, you're a goal situation. Oh, he'll be and, delighted to hear. And it. he's he's a great husband and dad and like he's just an all around amazing dude. A good dude, a very very good dude. I want to jump right back because um, we've been chatting with lots of people this year because it was obviously the Warp Tour 25th anniversary this year. A few years back, but I just been getting from everyone kind of memories of the times they played it. How was yeah. that experience for you? <laughs> um, okay, Warp Tour. Um, <laughs> well. I'll tell you this, in many ways, from a sort of psychological perspective, it was the hardest summer of my life. Not the first to have said that, I'll be honest. Yeah, Um, and we, you know, everyone has extenuating factors that like create that, but it really was, it was psychologically very grueling. 
the flip side of that is that it created this kind of like, I think I had resilience before that tour, but it, it hardened and solidified that resilience in a way that I don't actually think, I don't think there's any other analog, touring analog for Warp Tour, just in terms of like the weather, the uncertainty every day of when you're gonna play. And I think, you know, the biggest lesson for me, which I, I cherish truly, is every day you have to play a show with no vibe. Right, yeah. So like, you're in the brew, it's not even just no vibe. It's like, most festivals it's like, kind of a nice breezy day and like, the stage looks like, has all these cool designs and like, you know, there's like, wine around. Like, I, I don't think they sell wine at Warped, I have no clue, maybe they do. Yes, I, we'll find out. I feel like it's just beer, um, in or a parking lot. In, a, yeah. in a parking lot. So it's just like, there is no vibe per se, the vibe is the energy, right? So like, you can't rely on lights and haze and a dark room and people being kind of tipsy at 10 p.m. Like, all those tricks just don't apply. And I think like, for me, that was such an important learning experience and gave me the tools, I hope and think, that with lights and with the haze, at night, when people are a little drunk, um, for the show to, to be like, at a different kind of level. And I don't think that would have been possible if I had not done a summer of Warped Tour. Yeah, I guess that's it, isn't it? That show every day at different times of day as well and everything, it's you're gonna get, you, there's no way you can come out of that tour a worse performer. You oh my God, no, no, no. It's And it's such an egalitarian atmosphere. It really does, it really is sort of an ego. It's, it's a destroyer of ego. Right. As long as you're not a narcissist already, but yes, like, yeah. You know, and I think ego destruction or ego loss is like such a crucial development as a human sure. being. Warped Tour like really kind of <laughs> sped that up for me. Hey, it's no bad thing. That's a cool Thanks, vibe. Kevin. I appreciate it. <laughs> Shout out, Kevin. You're doing work, man. You're doing the work. Uh, let's talk about what's coming next then, because obviously still very much in, you know, album mode, touring mode. Have you thought about what may be coming in the future in terms of music or whatever you want to work on next? 100%. Um, I mean, you know, I'm always I'm always looking to the future, largely because I'm an anxious person, but um, it sometimes serves me well. Um, so I've been working on some other collaborations which aren't public yet, but I'm really excited about okay. um, with, I think, some unexpected people, which is cool. Um, give me a hint. Go on. Give me a hint. Um, don't, don't, don't give it too much away, obviously. Okay. But. Uh, one, one of the collaborations is with a Commonwealth artist. Okay. Okay. So a non-American. Yeah. Branching out. Nice and vague. Bran okay. Yeah, but you said <laughs> I know, I'm not good, giving it away. That. Um, that's just, just a little hint. That's what I want. That's good. I've been writing for other people. I had, um, yeah, two songs on the last Fits and the Tantrums record. I've got, I wrote four songs on the new Bishop Briggs record with Sarah, which is really exciting. Comes out November 8th, and I'm so proud of her. It's, it's a, she's, Doing, she's killing it. She's doing great, and a few other things in that world where I'm just I'm behind the scenes, just like being a part of something. First two months of next year, I'm gonna have some time to get back in the studio, and it's like it's always that to me. It's it's the push and pull of like you go on the road, you immerse yourself in the chaos of that. You remember what it's like to interact with the songs in a physical way, and then you have new tools and inspiration to make that material so that's what I'm I, I'm always excited about that balance but um yeah I just feel honestly I feel really creatively inspired right now and the shows have been amazing and got a great crew out here and we're just like yeah we're Enjoy also watching ride. we're watching the Sopranos all right oh you're getting caught up are you we're, first yeah. time rewatching. first time first time first time where you at, where you at? What's we are so at far? um season one episode six. Oh wow so we've, really early on. well okay. we just started we just started literally just started fair play yeah like we were watching one a night <laughs> oh right okay you do, oh, so you're doing one a night through we're the doing tour. it like after the show see yeah. this is what happens when you stop like you know binge drinking whiskey <laughs> is usually like, <laughs> you can't find a you, way to chill out some people so, do that with the Sopranos that's all good <laughs> I think it's a very nice coping mechanism Mechanism. Absolutely, um, and uh, yeah, so we're doing that. Nice, but it's been yeah, it's been it's been awesome. No, it sounds like it's been a great tour, and uh, and yeah, best of luck with the rest of it. Have a great show here in London tonight. Thank and you. And hopefully, yeah, we'll see you back in the UK. Hopefully, not in the not too distant future. We yes, hope. yes, awesome. I hope so. All right, look forward to it. Good to see you. All right, thank okay, you. Okay, play.